Sure. It's a great honor to welcome uh, Professor Peter Skerry, uh, Professor of Political Science in Boston College to this program. How are you today, Peter? I'm very fine, thank you. And yourself? I'm doing pretty well. Um, Good. So the topic uh, we have in this conversation will be the thoughts and uh, scholarship of one Nathan Glazer, the great um, American sociologist and professor at Harvard University, who happened to be uh, a mentor of yours. So I should like to begin by asking you, how did you come to be a student of his, of Professor Glazer? Well, um, it, the I met him in the um, early 1970s uh, when I was a graduate student um, at Harvard University. Mm -hmm. um, and I was anticipating, I thought I was pursuing a graduate program in neo-Marxist economics. Mm. And, um, but uh, I had plenty of options to take different kinds of courses at that point. And one of the courses that I noticed touched on a topic that um, I had long been interested in as much for personal reasons as for academic reasons. It was a course on ethnicity and social policy, which was uh, a seminar being taught by Nathan Glazer whom I'd obviously um, heard of and read, uh, but had never encountered. And the topic was something that I was very interested in because I grew up in a working class uh, background in, in Boston. And um, ethnicity was something that was much part of the of everyday life. It was politics that my family was involved with at the local and state level. Mm -hmm. And it was a topic that many of my friends and colleagues on the left, among whom I aspired to be, be you know, to, to, to uh, be part of, and hence my study in neo-Marxist economics, um, weren't terribly interested in. Um, so I wasn't quite um, prepared to, reject uh my interests in ethnicity and and so forth and those that history of of my my life and as well as of boston in the united states um so i was i decided i would take glazier's uh seminar um out of those kinds of interests and in some ways if you will hedging my bets as we say um i i wasn't prepared to uh reject his understanding and his version of social science, which I might say uh, in the 1970s among young people of my cohort was not fashionable, obviously. Um, Marxism, neo-Marxism, uh, variations on that on the left were very much, were very, you know, that was the dominant trend. And uh, what Nathan Glazer was doing was sort of old fashioned, uh, um, not of great interest to many young people, um, but I, I, I didn't quite share those feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell me a bit about how your upbringing and how, you know, Professor Glazer's his teachings uh, perhaps have may have resonated with it. Oh, <clears throat> well, in many ways, it didn't resonate at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nathan Glazer you know, came from a very different kind of background uh, from from mine, again, which is a reflection of his interest and my interest in ethnicity. He grew up the child of uh, uh, Jewish immigrants from uh, Eastern Europe. His parents spoke Yiddish, didn't speak any English. He was the youngest of, I think, six children. Um, his father was a garment worker uh, and a member of the Garment Workers Union, which had some influence on uh, Nathan Glazer's subsequent interests in life. Uh, he grew up in a very, very poor and deprived background 
uh, in early 20th century New York City. Um, he also grew up in a, a background uh, in an environment that was intensely uh, political and intellectual. Uh, you know, the Jewish intellectual tradition, whether religious or political, was not at all like the working class Irish Catholic background that I grew up in in mid-century America, which was not at all intellectually oriented uh, to the extent that uh, I was interested in politics. And I was, it was because my family was directly involved in rather local, one would have to say mundane, as we say in, 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 in English, bread and butter, common, you know, everyday issues um, with no broader intellectual or ideological agendas. So um, my background was much more similar to the background of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, uh, with who was somebody else I, I was interested in and uh, eventually worked for for a short time in Washington, and who was a co-author uh, uh, with Nathan Glazer and a close friend and colleague. Um, my background was much closer to, to Moynihan's than it would, would have been to, to, to Nat Glazer's. So, um, but but if I might continue, that does also speak to to Nathan Glazer's uh, extraordinary, um, and this really I think in many ways sets set him apart from many of his colleagues uh, among neoconservatives among that generation of neoconservative intellectuals that came out of New York City. Um, he was an extraordinarily uh, open and um and um um well open and and curious man about all sorts of things not just politics not just ethnicity he was a student of cities of architecture um he loved to travel he was widely traveled around the world had spent lots of time in india where his uh where his second wife came from um, when he was a young man, before he um, was really established uh, in the late 1950s, maybe 1960, he sec managed to secure a fellowship to, to spend a year in Japan and thought he might focus on Japanese studies. Uh, mm -hmm. and, he, and he was in his late 30s, early at that time. That's not something that his that his colleagues and comrades among the, uh, using that word advisedly, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the left in those days were, were interested in. Um, Nat Glazer was an extraordinarily curious and open man who, um, who wasn't always easy to deal with. He was, he was often very distracted and preoccupied with his own, with his own thoughts but he was always open to, to meeting and encountering different people. And, uh, and I, I think that's, um, that, that was the basis on which uh, I, I got to know and work with Professor Glazer. He, he was just an extraordinarily curious individual, albeit in many ways, we didn't share very much by way of background. Now, over time, um, given my own trajectory, moving from the left to a more conservative direction, there were things that I had in common with him, but that's it was kind of in retrospect, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan um, because um, he is also someone I've been reading up on a lot lately. And uh, he has said of uh, Nathan Glazer, uh, within the rooms of the New York Public Library, this is a quote, Nathan Glazer did the research that disproved Karl Marx. Um, let's, um, let's talk about how uh, Professor Glazer first encountered and perhaps uh, followed Marxism, Marxism and his journey away from it. Okay, well, I think the quote by uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan um, is certainly an accurate quote. Um, he also at one point said... Um, uh, in the same vein uh that there's a statue of Karl Marx in front of the uh, in front of the British library mm -hmm. uh uh in London 
but there's no there's such no statue, statue of Black Razor. Right. And and his son, that is to say, Moynihan's son, eventually built uh, um, a statue um, out of uh, uh, various materials. That's a that's a statue of Nat Glazer mm. as if he were speaking <laughs> to a political crowd in front of the Public Library of New York. Um, um, I'm pleased to say that I inherited that statue. Actually, I have it in my home now. It was in Nat Glazer's living room for many years. Um, and um, so that's that's the that's the the perspective that Mo that Moynihan brought to this. I think in his affectionate, somewhat exaggerating way, um, um, Moynihan was was taking liberties with with uh, with with Nat Gla Glazer's work and 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 perspective. Um, I don't think Nat Glazer was ever uh, a hardcore, serious Marxist. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure he was influenced by his friends and colleagues who undoubtedly were serious students of Marx. And I'm sure at some point early in his, in his intellectual political development at City College in New York in... Um, what would have been the 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 early 30s i guess um I, i'm sure he was in in groups that you know read the texts and debated and discussed marx but i don't i don't believe he ever would have called himself a marxist um he he was clear I, i'm sure he considered himself when he was a young man a socialist uh he was very influenced by labor zionism and um and and that movement of 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 young Jews focused on uh, uh, the socialist, the evolution or development of socialism in in, uh, in in Israel and what that meant for the Jewish people, but I, I I'm I, I'm not I'm not sure I'm not aware that he ever had some sort of um, overwhelming commitment to Marxism such that it came to a point where he he finally disavowed or broke with it. Mm -hmm. um, Having said that, um, it is true um, that his work very early on um, clearly departed from orthodox Marxism in, of, of the sort that was being practiced by other young intellectuals and, uh, and political uh, activists of the time. He was focused on cultural phenomena uh, at a time when when uh, uh, more uh, politically oriented Orthodox Marxists in the United States weren't, um, he was focused on on ethnicity and the uh, on, on the importance of ethnicity. Um, um, so I, again, um, I I don't think one should have the impression that he made a radical shift from Orthodox Marxism um, and and a class analysis to something. Um, more uh, familiar uh, in terms of his subsequent work. I think it was much more of a continuum. Mm -hmm. And of course, when Senator Moynihan um, mentioned the research that disproved Karl Marx, um, I'm assuming he was talking about, again, his uh, Nathan Glazer's, as well as his work uh, researching on ethnicity in America, which uh, culminated in the book Beyond the Melting Pot, published in 1965. Yes. Um, can you please tell me uh, what was the findings that Glazer and Moynihan, um, you know, uh, I guess, uh, came came upon and how did it, uh, how did it disprove uh, Marx, the great German? <laughs> well, um, it not only disproved just again it, it not only disproved marx um it disproved much um social science and 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 popularized versions of social science thinking in the american public in the post-war era uh, because the dominant perspective in the post-war era was either that we were becoming um, uh, 
a middle class society where um, class was not terribly important because there was great mobility uh, up and down the the, the, the the social class ladder. <laughs> and at the same time, we were becoming more and more um, mixed as a people that Yes, America was a nation of immigrants, uh, although the immigration had been greatly curtailed earlier in the 20th century. And the overall effects of the Depression and World War II was to mix the population. Um, and that we what we had in the in the in the post-war era in the 40s and 50s was the emergence uh, of what many social scientists now were arguing was a mass society where 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 a much more atomized mobile society composed of relatively mobile individuals um who um who in in some sense share everything and share nothing there's no there, there's no no common sense of history or origins that we were developing in that kind of direction which in fact, was 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 in some ways what the neo Marxists of that era were were, were arguing, um, although that was more broad, broadly accepted as a perspective. But the bottom line is that we were becoming more and more alike, uh, and and the di differences among uh, different parts of the United States as the economy was integrating, um, and. We, and we were becoming much more of a cohesive nation where regional differences were less and less important, uh, that we were all becoming more and more like each other. And what Moynihan and Glazer argue in Beyond the Melting Pot is that no, uh, that the differences that we've had among ourselves historically, uh, and they were specifically focused on ethnic and religious, reflecting our very diverse immigrant origins that those differences weren't disappearing uh they were persisting they were changing but they were persisting uh and in many ways in the context of new york city they were becoming the basis of a kind of interest group politics um that in fact um many of the italian americans second second and third generation italian americans in new york um were involved in certain kinds of municipal jobs uh for example the sanitation department where historically italians got those kinds of jobs because they were not very uh well educated and they were the among, among the last of new york city so those were the least desirable jobs um but um that was also the basis of their labor union activity in what became a fairly powerful and an influential New York City labor union. So it was an argument that these differences while while changing and evolving are very persistent and have a way of continuing to influence um, what was regarded as straightforward interest group politics in, in, in New York and other major American cities. Uh -huh. You know, um, these days um, we the conversation does not really focus on ethnicity anymore, but about race, um, particularly <clears throat> whites and blacks. And among the people who are called whites these, day, uh, these days, um, somehow it has uh, begun to include, well, not only the Irish and the Italians, but also Hispanics and um, Jews and well, even Asians. They are now called whites. And, and so what would... Um, if Glazer was alive today and he saw the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, what would he what would he have uh, concluded? Well, um, um, I'd like to think that he would have concluded what I've concluded. Uh, in an article that I wrote that I believe you've you've read about uh, why Black Lives Matter matters. Yeah. Um, and um, um, 
and I do mean, and I and I'm sincere that I I think he would he would he would agree with with what I argued in this in this article that I wrote a couple of years ago, which is that, um, and, and indeed I I I cite him in the in the course of this article, which is to say that um, um, that Black Lives Matter as a movement, um, is rather flawed, um. It doesn't have much of a genuine social base. It's much more of a media and social media phenomenon, which can't be dismissed, but is not the 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 nature of a serious social or political movement. Um, but but nevertheless, it reflects um, the reality that in many ways, since the late 1990s. Uh, the concerns, the issues, the the plight, the continuing challenges facing Black Americans were largely ignored. Um, they were ignored partly because of the of the post nine eleven effect. Um, um, after nine eleven, we were, Americans were preoccupied, obsessed. One might argue with um, with um, Islam and the presence of Muslims in the United States, as well as our our um, efforts overseas, um, or alternatively, if we weren't focused on on the situation of uh, the cities and African Americans, we were focused on immigration and what was going on at the border, which translates into Mexican immigrants and and Hispanics more generally, um, and that I think Black Lives Matter reflects an effort uh, in the wake of some rather dramatic killings of black teenagers to put the black agenda back on the political uh, on the political front page, as it were. Um, and I, I think um, I think that would be very much what this the spirit um, of, of, of Matt Glazer's perspective today. He'd be critically, critically sympathetic to it. In, in the sense that I've just described. Mm -hmm. You know, one can say to those who, you know, the agenda of bringing, uh, you know, the Black ethnicity uh, back into political discourse by saying, well, you know, in 2009, uh, Barack Obama sworn in, and you can say that he was the first Black president, and he, he stuck around until 2017, which has made him a two-term president. He served for as long as he could as a black president. So, um, and also how come, how come race relations arguably got worse after, uh, after or even during his presidency? Well, um, I don't know that I'd, I, I don't know that I would uh, agree that they got worse. I, I would argue that they got neglected, oh. okay? Um, and and then I I suppose you could then say, to the extent that those issues were neglected, the problems that many Americans face got worse. Okay, but I I think I I would be more comfortable saying that that they got neglected. They certainly they certainly didn't get better. That's for sure. Okay, uh, certainly, but, although one must be careful. Um, I wouldn't want to give anyone, particularly um, your listeners overseas. Uh, in Vietnam or anywhere else, the impression that there has not been improvement in the situation of African Americans over the last 50 years in America. There have been enormous changes and enormous improvements. Mm -hmm. And we now have a black middle and upper middle class uh, of substantial proportions that we never had. Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't lingering problems, especially among those African Americans who have not benefited from the various policies and changes that we've had. And in some ways, their situation is worse because they've been deprived of, for lack of a better term, indigenous leaders. Um, the, 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 the middle-class oriented individuals who once would have, because of segregation, lived among the more desperately poor and disadvantaged blacks, um, their situation because they lived among them, now don't live among them. They they have moved up the the social e economic ladder and have very different lives, which is a good thing. But it has deprived 
many of the African Americans who have been left behind of you know of 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 leadership and and neighbors who who are upwardly mobile and understand their situation and who can be mo role models for their for the for their for their children. Um, so there has been progress. It just has been not across the board. I just want to make that clear. I see. Um, so having said that, I've sort of lost track of what your original question was. I'm sorry. Oh, so uh, I was just saying that, you know, how, you know, Barack Obama became president. Ah, and, yeah, sure. Well, I think that's an example of what I said in a way, which is that we let we elect our first African-American president and certainly in in the first term that was a big deal a lot of people voted for barack obama uh the first time around who didn't vote for him the second time around simply because there was such a a sentiment that this was a a, a good thing for african americans and a good thing for america mm -hmm. but once he was elected um in some ways that sends a signal to people well you know we've solved that problem uh we have we, we we've uh, we that's been achieved. There hasn't been a Jewish uh, president elected. There have many other groups have not managed to get somebody into the White House. So this signals a drastic change in 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 the American way of life. Well, it was obviously a big a big development uh, and an enormous change, uh, but it didn't change things structurally, uh, socially, or economically for many Black Americans. So I think. I would explain it that way. I see. You know, uh, back to Nathan Glazer. Um, I saw an episode of uh, Ben Wattenberg's show, uh, Think Tank, on YouTube, um, and he explained yes. how, with uh, you know, with the help of uh, James Q. Wilson, another great uh, sociologist, how uh, the difference between the social social science that was practiced before, I guess, before Nathan uh, Nathan Glazer and Moynihan and the rest of the public interest uh, crew uh, emerges. And the way I see it is that the social science that was practiced before them were dominated by theory. Um, there, was a, there were a handful of theories that existed and were discussed. And these uh, well-known sociologists, I guess, I'm thinking of people like Margaret Mead or um, who is that guy in British, uh, Kinsey, uh, who, who had a theory about how human beings function and they went out and they basically, they basically found evidence that only, you know, that by, that was, that were biased in favor of the, the theory in question. And the, the sociologists that came after it, uh, Glazer, Moynihan, um, Charles Murray, another great uh, but controversial public intellectual. Um, they were motivated by some of their distrust or at least their disagreement on some of the uh, far reaching programs that uh, Johnson's great society was implementing. And they were, they were looking for hard concrete social data that backs up their disagreement of uh, Johnson's uh, programs and the way yes. I see it yeah the um, the social science the that plays or practice versus the one that Mead and Co one was um one was deeply concerned about the particulars of human life i.e ethnicities and religious uh, background and class uh, you know and but uh the the more Marxist influenced social science uh, if I can put it that way was more concerned with uh, universal ideals and uh, I guess universal truths, if you can say it about human life. Uh, would you yeah. would you say that to be a uh, accurate description? Well, I guess I'd say yes and no. I, I I think I can see what you're trying to outline, but I guess I would I would put it differently. Um, I mean, first of all, it's it's hard to. I mean, Margaret um, um, Mead. Yeah. Uh, Margaret Mead was, um, you know, she, she's a difficult person. I, I mean, she's an anthropologist. You, uh, in some ways, you can't be more empirical uh, and down on the ground, literally and figuratively, than an anthropologist, right? Uh -huh. And she did field work as an anthropologist. Uh, 
But then she became, uh, you know, a, a public intellectual who was propounding on all sorts of issues where she was speculating in an informed way as much as anything, which is not in some ways unlike what Matt Glazer or James Q. Wilson or many of the other uh, neoconservative intellectuals you're talking about did after having done a lot of research. And there's nothing mm -hmm. dishonorable about that. But I, I wouldn't I wouldn't start with, with Margaret Mead. Um, okay. I would say that... What um glazer and um and james q wilson who was another mentor of mine by the way um um what what they were about um and to some extent daniel patrick moynihan although he's a more complicated figure he was a he was a political poli he was a politician as much as a an academic and um i think he would have been the first to tell you that he didn't do real social science research. Uh, he was a writer and, and an informed observer of political and social phenomena, not to discount his contributions, but he was playing in a different on a different court, if you will. Um, but um, what Nat Glazer, James Q. Wilson, and the other uh, uh, academics of, of, of that public interest crowd were doing, were, were they were reacting to one, the narrowly focused, often quantitative um, behavioral social science that was coming to dominate uh, uh, American American universities uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, um, that which a kind of social science that tended to look at at at, at questions and issues very narrowly. Um, very quantitatively often and um often claiming to be value free or value neutral or striving for value neutrality mm -hmm. not taking a position and um i think the people in and around nathan glazer and his colleagues uh, found that posture increasingly uncomfortable and 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 maybe even disagreeable uh over the course of the 1950s and 1960s uh in nat glazer's case he was clearly we haven't talked about this very very preoccupied and heavily involved in the issue of communism in american life mm -hmm. and the infiltration of american society by by communists you know in some way shape or form tied to the soviet union um, and he played a, an important role in writing about and exposing those kinds of ties, not in some sort of um, um, uh, yellow journalism uh, perspective, but he was a serious student of the Rosenbergs and, and their guilt and innocence and so forth, and the impact of communism on American life. Um, he, um, he, he, he personally was never caught up in this behavioralist, narrow, often quantitative understanding of social science. Oh. He, 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 he had a much more full-throated uh, and engaged perspective on what social science was about. And I think many of his colleagues uh, who wrote for the public interest, including James Q. Wilson, in the course of the 19... 60s in the social upheaval of that era, uh, when they saw many of their academic colleagues who had been striving for or professing to practice um, value-free social science, saw them making choices, either unwilling to face up to student protesters who were wreaking havoc on the universities, or students who were demanding that universities and academics take positions on political questions, including the Vietnam War, they saw their environment suddenly become very politicized. Mm -hmm. And they saw social scientists who said that they were practicing neutral value free social science, not either either not not standing up to the political forces that were assaulting the university, or they were caving into them and going along with them in one way or another. Um, so 
Glazer and company were standing up to these deep changes in American intellectual and university life. Um, and, and, and I think that is, a, to my mind, a better way of trying to explain how they came to take the posture that, that, that they did. Um, it was more of a reaction to mainstream behavioral quantitative um, uh, social science that was getting overwhelmed by the student movement, the impact of the Vietnam War on the universities and the, and the broader changes in American society. And they didn't see their more narrow, uh, traditional, if you will, social scientists standing up to those threats and challenges. I see. Yeah, that neatly brings us to the topic of the neoconservatives whom uh, Glazer has uh, perhaps associated himself with for decades. And, you know, I've always been bothered by how, you know, the word has been, has been, you know, has had a bad, you know, stain on it. Like it's, a, it's being used as a pejorative to describe a whole wide range of, range of people. But nevertheless, you know, for the sake of um, simplicity, let's just use it. Um, so I've mentioned the Public Interest, which was a journal that uh, Glazer edited, uh, along with one Irving Kristol, who is also a magnificent thinker. Um, and the way I see it, again, uh, the neoconservatives who, you know, as the name suggests, they were sort of latecomers to the conservative movement, if I can say it that way. Um, they were, many of them were liberals. Uh, some of them were even socialists and Marxists. I know that Crystal himself was an avowed Trotskyist. Yep. And they have, you know, they were bothered by the increasing radical radicalization of their own party, the Democratic Party, as well as the mainstream culture at large, was, which was going overwhelmingly left. Of course, they've had their problems with the right as well, with uh, their, I guess, uh, <clears throat> negotiations with communism and not being tough enough on the Soviets. But um, the public interest uh, was Crystal, uh, Nathan Glazer, as well as Daniel Bell's efforts to, to bring a, a different perspective, one that is not left, one that is not radicalized, and one that is a more fact-based, evidence-based, and balanced, I'm assuming. So, yeah. Um, so, to what extent do uh, Glazer, I guess, uh, is Glazer in agreement or in disagreement with his uh, fellow uh, neoconservatives, so called? Um, well, in the in the sense that you were just talking about, which, um, which is to to use a word that you, your listeners may or may not feel totally comfortable with methodologically he was he was very much in sync with what you were saying um part of that is what i was just got through saying that th there was a certain disaffection with mainstream social science uh but there was also as you rightly pointed out a, a real disaffection with the ideological orientation which was developing among young leftists at the university that, that's also part of what was going on that i did not mention that you are right to point to mm -hmm. so their their reaction um, was to both narrow social science that wasn't prepared um, uh, to look at difficult social problems and to and to and to you know and to be prepared to make difficult policy and political choices. On the other hand, the increasing ideological orientation of of many uh, leftists, uh, ideological in the negative sense. Of course, of of not being concerned with or even denying, um, sort of the facts on the ground, as it were, uh, but being more preoccupied with the you know broad deductive kinds of arguments from 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 fundamental principles. So they 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 definitely shared that, and that's what I think motivated Matt Glazer through most of his career, as 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 a as a matter of fact. Um, but, um, um, that, that 
that clearly what was what I think was the driving force behind neoconservatism. Mm -hmm. um, neoconservatism, as you just indicated by mentioning Irving Kristol, um, was composed of many different individuals who had rather broad, well, I won't say broad differences, but clear differences among themselves on a variety of, of questions. And um, it was never a, a really, it was not as coherent uh, an intellectual movement uh, as, as many outside of it um, argued. There were, there were, you know, there, there were, there were, there were significant differences in style and in substance among these various writers and 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 social scientists. But they, um, you know, they did share what what you what you put on the table and what I've tried to elaborate on. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure that really directly answers your question, but you can try again if you like. But that that that's my best stab at what you offered. I see. Well, um. I think uh, we'll we'll get to a disagreement that Nate, Nathan Glazer would have uh, with uh, many of his more right-leaning peers, and that is the issue of affirmative action, which, uh, uh, you know, as he grew older um, and more experienced in his scholarship, he would uh, he would re recant his original opposition to it. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, for those who are not Americans, uh, uh, perhaps uh, you can give us a definition of what affirmative action means. And uh, well, first, uh, Glazer's original position on it, which was articulated in his book, Affirmative Discrimination. Yes. Well, yeah, uh, uh, affirmative action um, was a, uh, a policy that... Um, uh, developed, let me just, um, uh, okay, we back on track. Yep. Um, um, affirmative action began, um, actually, uh, under a, a Republican administration, the administration of uh, Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. Um, 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 and it was originally an effort to bring in more um, African-American workers in the building trades uh, uh, in, you know, in large construction projects on university campuses and in downtown buildings, mm -hmm. um, basic blue collar laboring jobs that were secure and very well paying because they were dominated by labor unions. Um, and that was originally a scheme or pr proposal or plan that the Nixon administration devised partly as an effort to respond to what was going on among African Americans and the unrest in American cities and, and the continuing turmoil uh, among African Americans in American society in the late 60s. And at the same time, uh, it was foisted on labor unions as a, as, and, and seen as a way of creating problems for labor unions because their unions were dominated by white ethnics. I talked before mm -hmm. about Italians in New York City being heavily involved in the sanitation workers union. Well, there would have been many Italians and other white ethnic children of, of immigrants uh, who hadn't gone to college, who would have been working in those building trades unions in the late 1960s and forcing or compelling or encouraging labor unions to bring in African-American workers would have obviously pitted uh, posed a problem for the for the labor union leaders because the the jobs that they would have been providing for African Americans would have been seen as at the expense of the jobs that were that that were being held by their white ethnic white working class members. So it began in a in a kind of curious context, um, and it was not an effort of quotas in its original instance. It was not a program that said, if there are 10% African-Americans in your metropolitan area, then 10% of the worker buildings in downtown Boston, for example, need to be African-Americans. It was not necessarily matching population numbers with employment numbers. It began to evolve in that direction. Um, 
Um, and that's when affirmative action came to be seen as a program of quotas, um, which in many ways is the logic of, of affirmative action that main that that is still with us today. Um, we tend to think in popular discourse in America today, and this has been promulgated by the media, but also by all sorts of uh, uh, media outlets, uh, not just the electronic media, that if your population in a metropolitan area is 15% black, well, then there ought to be 15% of blacks uh, in the various occupations across town, 15% of your of, of black should be represented in, in the highest income strata, as well as the middle income strata. It's that kind of thinking that affirmative action tended to evolve into, uh, which of course means if you have to have 15% of a given group in a, in a given type of job, well, are there enough qualified blacks to fill those jobs in that given situation well uh that's often not the case simply because our economy doesn't work that way and obviously because african americans have encountered various kinds of obstacles in their lives that don't situate them well to take um middle class or college or jobs that require a college degree so over time a program to provide a hand or a help to African Americans, give them acknowledgement, give, give them special training that will allow them to compete uh, as individuals for various types of jobs, evolved into a kind of program in various sectors of American life that basically argued for quotas, that if 15% of the population is black, in uh in 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 a given area well then 15 percent of your of your workers should be black 15 percent of your students should be black that kind of rigid quota thinking um and that's that's the kind of thinking that was a challenge to notions of individual merit um and individual achievement that uh, Nathan Glazer and many neoconservatives um, objected to. They objected to the notion of quotas as undermining and and uh, and uh, um, a, a, and corrupting notions of individual merit in a society that was based on notions of individual merit and achievement. All the, we have violated those notions of individual merit and achievement in many ways in our society, especially when it came to African-Americans. So Glazer was trying to, um, was, was launched a critique of affirmative action as quotas in hiring situations. That's what comes through in his book, uh, Affirmative Discrimination that came out sometime in the mid 1970s. Um, and, but over time, as you, um, his position, changed and softened, softened and changed, and he became much more tolerant uh, of affirmative action and, and the establishment of racial quotas of some sort applied to African Americans, especially at, at the university, um, where he felt that was very much a critical institution that was important to open it up to disadvantaged minorities um, and if quotas were the way to do that, he was prepared quotas that didn't necessarily, um, that were not necessarily based on objective achievement criteria. In other words, you didn't have to get the same grades or the same test scores to get into a given university um, uh, as the main, uh, in other words, you could, you could, you could allow in disadvantaged minority groups, individuals from such groups with lower achievement scores, lower meritorious factors in light of their, of their disadvantaged background in order to get them into the universities and put them on their way to a, a middle, upper middle class achievement path. Um, so he did change his position over time. Um, and I'm, it's a complicated history. I'm not sure how well I've done, but 
over over the course of his career um did change i i don't think it's because he became um more learned or more scholarly as, as something you suggested i think it's simply nat glazer responding to what he took to be changes in the political and social environment that re required a rethinking of his original position mm -hmm. Yes. I, if, I, if I could, I, could I mention one other complicating factor here? Yes, please. Well, we've been talking about affirmative action um, as a program exclusively focused on African-Americans. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's not the case. It was originally designed and intended, uh, however one defines affirmative action, it was some kind of effort to provide some kind of special help to African-Americans for very specific reasons, because they had a history, a, a unique history in American life. Um, but very soon after that, affirmative action came to be something that other disadvantaged groups claimed in American life, most notably Hispanics, especially um, Mexicans, Mexican immigrants, uh, also some Asians, uh, also women, um, um, and now gays, lesbians, and transsexuals are making some of those kinds of arguments that we too have been discriminated against. Therefore, we too deserve a special consideration so that our presence in numbers are acknowledged in your university or in the wider society. And Something that Nathan Glazer argued and that I share and have argued myself um, is that this has created a bigger problem, that we are now a society that has, is riven by disagreements among different claimant groups who are saying, we're 15% of the population, we're 30% of the population, we're, we're Hispanics in, 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 in California. Why isn't 30% of the University of California, uh, why isn't 30% of the, of the student body Hispanic? Because we're 30% of the population. Uh, well, there's lots of answers to that question. One of which is that, well, immigrants come in with no education. You can't expect them to be at the university within one generation. It takes time. Um, but this kind of argument reflects affirmative action becoming institutionalized in American life and being used by all sorts of groups in America for whom it was never intended. And that, I think, has worked to the disadvantage of African Americans. Right. And I think it's worked to the disadvantage of, of, of us all. And, and Nat Glazer um, was, was making those kinds of arguments too when he shifted his position on affirmative action. Yeah, so, you know, I do see the point that given uh... America's history in regards to ethnic ethnicity matters, uh, you know, it certainly hasn't a lot to atone for. But nevertheless, you know, my current position on affirmative action, following your definition, is that, well, yeah, I do see it as, as positive discrimination. It's just discrimination of another sort. And, you know, it tilts the playing field over those who are not you know less than qualified and of course uh, one must um, pay attention to the um, the the i guess the insecurity or the unconfidence that uh, a you know a a person of an ethnicity feels when he is deemed an affirmative action hire you know where his uh, peers and colleagues see him as perhaps less than them which is again fosters discrimination again and let, let me let me respond to what you just said for us for a moment yeah because um i i think you're i think you've confounded in a in a way that's a problem ethnicity and race okay right. um you said that america has you know many things to re apologize for i'm not objecting to that language that's fine we have lots of things to apologize for all all peoples do um, um, ab apologize ab with regard to ethnicity. Right. I, 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 I disagree with that. Okay. I think when it comes to ethnicity, America stands out in the world as a society that has 
uh, embraced large numbers of, of ethnic groups from all different parts of the world, different cultures, different languages, and done not a perfect job, for sure, but a remarkable job at absorbing them, integrating them, and allowing them to hold on to various aspects of their own culture, okay? France has done a great job of absorbing large numbers of ethnic groups too, but it's forced them to, to, to you know, to reject much of their past mm -hmm. and their backgrounds. We haven't done that. I think we've done a much more, um, a much more compelling job of allowing groups to become part of American society while holding on and, and feeling good about aspects of their own origin cultures. That's an ethnic story, okay? The racial story is something else. The racial story has to do with especially how we treated African Americans and discriminated them on the basis of race, also how we treated Native Americans on the basis of race. There, we have much more to answer for. And, and but, but what's happened, and I think the confusion, if I can say in your question, reflects the confusion in American society mm -hmm. because are Hispanics a racial group or an ethnic group? Right. Have they been discriminated against because of their race or have they been discriminated against on the basis of their ethnicity? Earlier in the program, you referred to them um, as being discriminated against as a racial group, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and you wouldn't be alone there. That's what Hispanics themselves claim. I would argue that it's much more the case that they were discriminated against like other immigrant ethnic groups. Uh, they came here from somewhere else. They didn't speak the language. They had different ways of presenting themselves. Um, all of those factors are, are, are basically ethnic factors. And the point about ethnic factors, of course, is that those can be changed. You can alter your language. You can alter how you dress. Um, uh, you can't alter your race. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's why racial discrimination is much more invidious than ethnic discrimination. Right. So, but we've set up a program in the United States, affirmative action based on race mm -hmm. that encourages Hispanics, for example, to say, we're a racial group like Blacks we've been discriminated against because of our race. And we, therefore we deserve affirmative action. Uh -huh. um, I find that extremely problematic because I think the evidence shows that Hispanics, especially Mexican immigrants, are assimilating into American life, into the middle class, uh, like other immigrant groups have. And they don't need affirmative action. Um, but that's not what their leaders are saying. That's not what the Democratic Party is saying, because the easier path is to, is to make a claim for affirmative action, right. because that, that's the program that is there. But I think that's one reason why race and ethnicity are so confused in America today. And it's also one reason why so many white Americans are so angry, mm. because they've been told by our leaders for the last 20 or 30 years that we are becoming a majority a majority minority society. And that means blacks, that means Hispanics, that means Asians. Um, um, but who wants to be a minority in a, in a, a white minority in a, in a society that was historically white? It seems to me that's a guaranteed argument to, to enrage ordinary white Americans. Um, and and that's that's one of the problems we're dealing with today. So I, I, I don't mean to harangue you. I'm just trying to suggest that this confusion between ethnicity and race, which was at the heart of Nat Glazer's preoccupations, he wrote about this, is, is, is critically important. And we, we're, losing, we're losing track of it. Right. Um, they're getting confounded for political reasons. Right, I understand. Yeah, I think yeah, I stand corrected. Obviously, I think the first thing that... Well, <laughs> anyone uh, the, the first thing that uh, anyone uh, that you can learn from Nathan Glazer is that race and ethnicity are different uh, concepts and we are sure. fighting those two for political causes yeah, exactly uh, um a couple of final questions um 
I know that in the late 90s, Glazer wrote the book, We Are All Multiculturalists Now. So um, can you explain uh, what his views are on the subject of multiculturalism? Yeah. Um, well, what 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 Nat Glazer was doing in that book uh, in in the mid nineteen nineties was reflected his his reaction to his own earlier work, like you had suggested, I think, and that it it, it and he explains in that book that um, he had resisted affirmative action um, as a policy, came to accept it and acknowledge it, especially for African Americans. Um, but it also reflected his 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 willingness to embrace um, a more explicit acknowledgement of the cultural uh, backgrounds of various other claimant groups, including Hispanics, including Asians, um, in the curricula of public schools and in the curricula uh, at various universities. And while, I mean, I think it, I, I don't think it, it reflected a fundamental change in his thinking it reflected more of a political rethinking of his of his opposition maybe even his hostility uh to special treatment or special regard for marginalized um groups in american society and it signaled his willingness to accept um an acknowledgement of the unique um, backgrounds and, if you will, gifts, the things that um, disadvantaged minority groups can bring to the public square and the things that the public square, say at public schools, uh, can do to acknowledge the special contributions of various kinds of, of ethnic and racial groups in American life. Um, I'm picking my words very carefully because while I think we're all multiculturalists now comes close to suggesting that Nat Glazer would be supportive of affirmative action, if you will, for all different kinds of minority groups, Hispanics, Asians, and Blacks. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think he would have pushed his own perspective that far. Um, and if this sounds a bit confusing to uh, to your listeners, it's because of the of the complicated issue I was trying to articulate just before you asked this question. Nat Glazer was a man of public affairs, and he and he was prepared at various and many points in his career to rethink his position on things. And I think we're all multiculturalists now. Is clearly his effort to rethink his earlier position rejecting affirmative action and such policies reaching out to various ethnic and racial groups. And while I think he was trying to move in a more quote unquote liberal direction with that book, I don't think he would, he would go as far in that direction as many people would like to think he did. That's it. Right. So final question. Um... You know, if uh, we haven't done this before, I do believe that our listeners uh, should be convinced to, you know, search up uh, Nathan Glazer's writings and uh, thoughts. But, uh, you know, for those who are um, participating in Harvard's sociology class or Harvard's political science class, as well as the those of any other um colleges and universities how would you how would you make the case for say the studying of Nathan Glazer to them like the 18 to 25 year olds who are occupying college campuses and lecture halls currently um 
well, I would, um, I would and have uh, recommended um, his work um, as an example um, of a social scientist who's prepared to look at a variety of types of evidence, not just quantitative, but historical, cultural, and um, and other sources, um, um, and who is not overly committed to any one political position. He, he clearly is somebody who's not afraid to come down and take a stand. And uh, in the academy today, um, as it has been for, I think, for many decades of my adult life, the, 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 the two obvious options are you take some obvious and almost predetermined political stand or, or methodological stand, or you refuse to, to come down anywhere and you, you, you articulate something that isn't very clear. It's hard to know where, what the implications of what you're saying are. Nat, Nat Glazer never, never pursued either one of those. He struggled with the evidence uh, and came to a conclusion uh, based on what he could discern from the evidence. And he was prepared to revisit and rethink uh, the evidence as it evolved because the evidence changes over time and political circumstances change over time. And he was always prepared to reevaluate and revisit what it was that originally uh, drew him in. And I think that kind of loyalty to the evidence, that willingness to dig into the evidence, and that willingness to change one's mind and to be prepared to defend a change in one's position um, is something that's obviously harder and harder and harder to do in American academic and public life. Um, and it's something that young people at the university, particularly those who are drawn to some social science for some use, they don't have to become social scientists, they might become lawyers, they might become journalists. Um, this openness to the evidence, genuine, sincere openness to the evidence, and being prepared to change what your position from what you might have concluded two years before, five years before, um, is an important lesson that we all need to bear in mind and that I think Nat Glazer um, uh, lived throughout his life. With that being said, well, thank you very much, Professor Peter Scarry, for your kind and thoughtful introduction to Nathan Glazer. And uh, thank you very much for being on the show. And I hope you take thank it yourself. Thank you for having me. And thank you for your very thoughtful uh, and interesting questions. Awesome. Thank you. Great.